the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Almighty. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Bow down before him, his glory proclaim. Gold of obedience and incense of lowliness. Bring and adore him, the Lord is his name. Lo, at his feet lay thy burden of carefulness. High on his heart he will bear it for thee. Comfort thy sorrows and answer thy prayerfulness, guiding thy steps as may best for thee be. Fear not to enter his courts in the slenderness of the poor wealth thou canst reckon as thine. Truth in its beauty and love in its tenderness, these are the offerings to lay on his shrine. These, though we bring them in trembling and fearfulness, he will accept for the name that is dear. Mornings of joy give for evenings of tearfulness. Trust for our trembling and hope for our fear. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Bow down before him, his glory proclaim. Gold of obedience and incense of lowliness, bring and adore him, the Lord is his name. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. You receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord have, Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are taught by your word that all our doings without love are worth nothing. Send your Holy Spirit and pour into our hearts that most excellent gift of love, the true bond of peace and of all virtue. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the first reading. A reading from the first book of Kings, chapter 8, verses 22 to 30 and 41 to 43. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands to heaven. He said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and steadfast love for your servants who walk before you with all their heart. 
the covenant that you have kept for your servant, my father David, as you declared to him. You promised with your mouth and have this day fulfilled with your hand. Therefore, Lord, God of Israel, keep from your servant, my father David, that which you promised him, saying, There shall never fail you a successor before me to sit on the throne of Israel, if only your children move to their way to walk before me as you have walked before me. Therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you promised to your servant, my father David. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. Regard your servant's prayer and his plea. O Lord my God, heeding the cry and the prayer that your servant prays to you today, that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you said, My name shall be there that you may heed the prayer that your servant prays toward this place. Hear the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. O oh, here in heaven, your dwelling place, heed and forgive. Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a distant land because of your name, for they shall hear of your great name, your mighty hand and your outstretched arm when a foreigner comes and prays toward this house then hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all that the foreigner calls to you so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your people Israel and so that they may know that your name has been invoked on this house that I have built the word of the Lord. Oh, 
chapter 6, of 10 to 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten a belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness as shoes for your feet. Put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me. So that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak. The word of the Lord.
Jesus said, Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats of me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The word that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe, and who was the one who would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you, that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have come to know and believe that you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. It was King Solomon's big day, the dedication of the temple. His father David had wanted to build a temple, if you remember. David had wanted to build a place for God to dwell and for the people to worship. But God said, no. God said, not you, David. Your son Solomon will build me a temple. And Solomon did. And after years of construction and expenses and the politics that go along with any building project, finally, finally, the temple was complete. All the people are gathered, and it was a full house for opening day. If Israel had had a mayor instead of a king, the mayor would have been on hand to cut a ribbon. But living as he did in a time when the separation of church and state made no sense, Solomon doesn't cut a ribbon or pose for the local press. He stands before the altar of the Lord and prays. And just as we heard in last week's reading, Solomon prays another good prayer. O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or in the earth beneath. He praises God for God's promises, including the promise that the temple would be completed. That promise is fulfilled. But then Sol Solomon asks a question that takes his prayer to a very different place. Solomon asks this, Will God indeed dwell on the earth? Even the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. Solomon indeed was a wise man. He knows that no matter how big the temple is, no matter how much it costs, no matter how glorious, it is not a container for God. So if why Solomon is right, if God is uncontainable, then where can we find God? Is God like Snuffleupagus, someone special, only special people or big bird can see? Or is God like the Pokeroo, an elusive character who slips in and out and makes us say in frustration, oh, I missed him again. Well, no, Solomon's question is, of course, rhetorical. In asking whether God can really dwell on earth, he is expressing wonder that God is choosing to dwell in the temple, a building made by human hands. In the next chapter of 1 King, God answers Solomon, Solomon's prayer and promises to be present in the temple. God says, 
I have heard your prayer and your plea. I have consecrated this house that you have built and put my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there all the time. And there's even more evidence that God indeed dwells on earth. There is, in a word, Jesus. As John, the Gospel writer, put it, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. So Solomon's question is rhetorical. Of course, God dwells with us and is present with us. It is rhetorical, but it is not meaningless. On the contrary, it masterfully sums up the reality of God's imminence and transcendence, that is, God's nearness and farness, and how both are true at the same time. The highest heaven cannot contain God, yes, and yet God chose to contain himself for our sakes, in a temple, in a manger, on the wood of a cross. Solomon's question is relevant to us today, even though the physical temple he made is long gone. It is relevant because it can guard us against two big mistakes in our thinking about God's presence. The first mistake we tend to make is making God too small. Solomon built the temple for God, but he knew it could not hold God. People often refer to the church, the physical building, as the house of God. I don't think we mean that we believe God literally lives here. We mean that we experience the presence of God here in a unique way. I don't think we bid farewell to God when we walk out the door on Sundays. My children have just returned from Pioneer Camp, and I remember in my own days of being a, camp, a camper myself and then a camp counselor. And one year when I was a camp counselor, um, we were saying goodbye on Saturdays, and one of the little girls, about eight years old, she was driving away with her parents, and she put her hand out the window and she yelled, goodbye Jenny, goodbye Kelly, goodbye you know all these people, goodbye trees and lakes, and then she said, goodbye God, and my heart just broke. Do we think of God as too small, dwelling in only specific places and times? Maybe this happens in what our image of God is like. If we see God only, uh, not only in a certain place, but only in a certain state, you know, seeing God is always only angry, or always only calm, or always male, or always anything. If we put God in a box, our vision is too small. Often we make God too small in our human relationships too. We stick only to our small circles, sometimes our small church circles, and we forget that God always calls us outward. One of the promises we make at baptism is to seek and serve Christ in all persons. And that word seek is there because it takes effort and initiative. We need to look for God, sometimes in unexpected places, in overlooked places, in the poor and the suffering. God is sovereign and free, and we cannot dictate how or when the Holy Spirit will work. The wind blows where it will, Jesus once said. You cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. The Lord was present in Solomon's temple, but only because he chose to be there. Solomon did not conjure God up with the right sacrifices or the right amount of gold. He simply responded with worship at the Lord's promise to be with him and with the people of Israel in that place. And so if the first mistake we make is making God too small, the second mistake we make is making God too big. Now how can that be possible? Didn't Solomon rightly say that even the highest heaven cannot contain God? Well, yes, and God is free and sovereign, big and infinite and beyond our control. But at a certain point, if we think of God only as big, we begin to think of God as untouchable or indifferent. God is big, the universe is big, what's the difference? After admitting that the temple could not hold God, Solomon continued his prayer in this way. O Lord my God, may your eyes be open night and day toward this house, 
the place of which you said, my name will be there. Solomon believes God's promise to be present, and we too can affirm that there are some things we can know about God. Many believe God is distant and unknowable, but Christians believe in a bleeding, dusty Savior who actually cares about us. There are some places and times and circumstances when God has promised to be present, where two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus said. There I am in the midst of them. And so if we don't remember that God is also small, also imminent, also with us, we fall into that uh, most well-meaning, smooth-sounding lie of our culture that all that matters is what matters to me. Bishop Will Willimon once traced the history of the church this way. Historically, the Catholic says, the church teaches. The first Protestant said, the Bible teaches. We say, it seems to me. Willimon goes on to say that our legitimate concern to be inclusive can hurt us in the end. If we try to say too much about God, to make God big enough and broad enough, to tolerate every desire and every opinion, we will end up saying nothing about God and helping nobody. Willimon put it this way, in our willingness to keep an open mind, he wrote, to be fair to all points of view, there is a great danger that we will build no house for God. All lazy religion ends in pantheism in which everything is God and nothing is God. With God in every rock and blade of, blade of grass, pantheism usually fades into atheism. God everywhere and in everyone becomes God of nowhere and nothing. It is good to call all saints a house of God if we meet a place where we meet God and encounter God. In worship, in prayer, in the hearing of his word, in the Holy Spirit, in the fellowship of one another, and in the breaking of bread. Do you remember when Jacob wrestled with the angel? He awoke and said, surely God is in this place. He met God there, and so he called that place Bethel, which means house of God. All of us need at least one Bethel, a place to meet with God. Will God indeed dwell on the earth? Yes even though the highest heaven cannot contain him. When we know both of these to be true, we will not make God too big or too small. We will give thanks for our Bethels and meet Jesus in the breaking of bread. Amen. We are following Litany number five on page 114. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the peace of the world. The Lord grant that we may live together in justice and faith. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for this country, and especially for Queen Elizabeth, the Governor General, the Prime Minister, and all in authority. The Lord help them to serve this people according to his holy will. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for children and young people. The Lord guide their growth and development. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the sick. The Lord deliver them and keep them in his love. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for all who are condemned to exile, prison, harsh treatment, or hard labor for the sake of justice and truth. The Lord support them and keep them steadfast. Lord, hear our prayer. We remember the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and all who have borne witness to the gospel. The Lord direct our lives in the same spirit of service and sacrifice. Lord, hear our prayer. Now we have a prayer for strength. Eternal God, you create us by your power and redeem us by your love. Guide and strengthen us by your spirit, that we may give ourselves today in love and service to one another and to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand. Remaining in your pew, please wish one another the peace of Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Hallowed be thy name, 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Two twelve, breaking of bread number four. I am the bread which has come down from heaven, says the Lord. Give us this bread forever. I am the vine, you are the branches. May we dwell in him as he lives in us. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us stand to pray. Living God, increase in us the healing power of your love. Guide and direct us that we may please you in all things. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God, whose His power, power working in us can do infinitely more than we could ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 